It always worries me when they say, now for the preaching, and everybody leaves. <laughs> so, we, one time in our church, I'd say, okay, it's time for the preaching, and they'd all go to the bathroom. So, you have to make rules, you know, somewhere along the line. So, we're delighted, I'm uh, delighted again to be here this morning, and uh, delighted to meet all of you, and to be with you again. It's my, uh, it's my distinct privilege to be here. I want you to open your Bibles this morning to Mark chapter 14. And I'm going to ask you to stand with me while I read a few verses here in Mark 14, beginning in verse number 1. Mark 14, verse number 1. <clears throat> Where the Bible says, After two days was the feast of Passover, and the un- un- unleavened bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft, and put him to death. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany, in the house uh, of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than three pence, uh, three hundred pence, and have given, been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She's come aforehand to anoint my body to the bearing. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. Father, I pray for your wisdom and your help and your power to preach the word of God this morning. We pray to minister to the hearts of every soul that's here today. I thank you for uh, this portion of scriptures become very uh, special to me. And I pray now that, Lord, you'll speak to us. And you'll glorify your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. In Luke chapter 7, this is the same story as uh, referred to. And the woman is not named in Luke 7 or in Mark 14. But there is an account of a similar story in John 12, where this woman is named Mary. And it's at the house of Lazarus. And Mary and Martha are there. And Lazarus is there. And uh, in, that, uh, in that chapter, the woman's name is Mary. And she anointed his, uh, his head. And uh, did you ever notice uh, that there's a difference between a fragrance and an odor? Uh, a lot of times, an eight-year-old boy will come in the house and somebody will say, Where have you been? You stink. That's not a fragrance. That's an odor. And uh, so uh, early Christians wanted to leave a legacy or testimony of their love for Jesus. But modern day Christians are more inclined to ask, what's in it for me? Mary, uh, uh, this woman gave uh, an alabaster box. We would call it a jar probably. And it was uh, worth 300 pence, which was about a year's salary. And she gave her most, she gave her best to Jesus. And she wanted him uh, to have the best she had. So, uh, they, uh, early Christians wanted to leave a fragrance. As a matter of fact, uh, in John chapter 12 and verse uh, 3, it says, The odor filled the house. The odor of the ointment filled the house. So it was a fragrance. I call this the fragrance of Mary. You know, when you've passed by somebody and sometimes they'll say to you, what is that you're wearing? What is that you're wearing? And, you know, you hate to tell them, well, it's uh, peeled onions or, uh, you know, it's a uh, it's, uh, hamburger breath or something like that. But usually they want to know what kind of a fragrance you're wearing. Or uh, There's only one fragrance that I wear. It's a man fragrance that anybody ever ever refers to, and so I try to get that every time I can because all the rest of it apparently doesn't do any good. 
but uh, the one that smells good, you like to you like to have more of that. You like to uh, you like to splash that on once in a while. Well, well, the odor of this filled the house, and there's several things about this that are interesting to me because uh, this woman made. Uh, a measured sacrifice which measured her devotion. If you look there in verse 3, it says, Being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman, unnamed woman, she, uh, having an alabaster box of ointment, of spikenard, very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on his head. Now in John 12, it says, Mary poured it on his feet. But there was no partial devotion here. She was all in. This was the best she, thing she could offer. It's probably the greatest treasure she had in her home. It was the most valuable thing she had, probably worth a, a, a the salary of a year. And uh, so she made total commitment and complete obedience. And uh, this was a bottle or a jar, a jar full of uh, uh, ointments uh, or uh, that that were used for healing and for uh, medicinal and for skin uh, care and that kind of thing. It had a wonderful uh, fragrance. And so they considered the alabaster to be the best material in which to preserve their ointments. And breaking the box probably means that breaking the seal of the box so it would come out like we would break the seal on a, on a product that we would buy. It was very precious. It might have been sold for more than 300 pence. And it was spikenard, or as referred to in their time, nard, it's the uh, head or spike of a fragrance of the East Indian plant belonging to a certain variety, which yields a delicious odor, a juice with a delicious odor on it, which the ancients used in the preparation of a most precious and expensive ointment. And so she had some, and uh, it was very costly. And uh, in fact, it's mentioned in the Song of Solomon. You'll, you remember the Song of Solomon. It says, in chapter 1, verse 12, While the king sitteth at his table, by my, spike mer, by my spike nerd sendeth forth the smell thereof. So it talks about a spike nerd uh, ointment at the table of the king. So this was a, something that was for people who had money, people that could afford it, and it was, uh, uh, it was a very special ointment. It gave a, gave a very delicious odor or... Uh, or fragrance. In John 12, it says, Mary took a pound of ointment, a spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And, and here's where it says, and the house was uh, filled with the odor of the ointment. So sometimes our house gets filled with the odor of a dog or the odor of a cat or the odor of a ham sandwich with onions on it. And uh, my wife says, what are you what are you cooking? Because she doesn't know I'm cooking anything, but it smells like it. And uh, so, and sometimes there'll be something in the trash that smells. And uh, so that's a pretty normal thing. But in Mark 14, 8, Jesus said, leave her alone. She hath done what she could. She's come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. So Mary uh, was all in. She did the best she could with what she had to work with. And she made a difference. She did something that would make a difference. Her devotion would make it a difference. She poured it on his head to, to uh, probably she didn't know all the theology, but to anoint him as the sacrificial lamb. She probably didn't understand all that she was doing, but she was fulfilling a prophecy and anointing him as the lamb of God. And she poured a heavenly fragrance on an earthly body. That goes along with what I was talking about in Sunday school. Some of our earthly bodies could use some heavenly fragrance, even if it's just soap and water. That'd be good. And so we use a heavenly fragrance on an earthly body. And this invited murmuring. Do you know that whatever you do for Jesus will cause somebody to complain? I mean, when you decide that you're going to... I remember now, you, when I got saved, I was just a teenager, and we started giving and going to church. You go to church how many times a week? And you give how much? And you give to missions? What is that? And so whatever you do for Jesus, when it comes from your heart, and you do the best you can, somebody's not going to like it. The devil doesn't like you doing the best you can for Jesus. Now, if you're trying to outdo somebody else, you're trying to compete with somebody else, that doesn't really even 
count, and that will probably create a lot of conflict. But when you do the best you can for Jesus, don't back down. Do the best you can for him. Be the best you can. And uh, so she poured it on his head, and it invited murmuring. They murmured against her in verse 15. And in verse uh, 4, it says, Why was this waste made? Why was this waste made? You know, some people have the idea that the money is only for uh, needs. They think money is only for needs. But Jesus said she hadn't wasted this. She's, uh, she, she's done what she could. She anointed me for my bearing, and she's done the best she could for that. And they said it might have been sold and given to the poor. Yeah, you, you know, there's a whole philosophy out there that says you ought to take all the money the rich people have and give it to all the poor people, and all the poor people will have money, but they didn't work for it, and they don't appreciate it. And uh, God never said, God said, if a man don't work, neither should he eat. So uh, there's always this philosophy. And I think there's this problem with, with a lot of immigrants. They come to our country thinking they can get something for nothing. And they don't even have a job. And then they give them the right to vote. And they can outvote the working people. And uh, Jesus said, you're always going to have the poor with you. You're always going to have people that want something for nothing and don't want to work for it. Churches have that. Sometimes people come to church when they, have a, when they have a dinner or when they can get a handout or when there's something that they can benefit from and they ought to benefit from the church. But they need to get past that and receive Jesus as their Savior and become part of the body and go on and help other people. See, it's not wrong to help. It's wrong to help people who won't be helped. It's wrong to help people who have a, a poor attitude. An attitude, I'm poor and I can't do anything. Would you help me? No, you're poor and I'll help you, but you need to help yourself the best you can. See? So, so there's always people. Jesus said the poor you have with you always. And they didn't say this because they cared for the poor. They said this because they wanted the money. They wanted the money. And uh, so <clears throat> the unsaved and unspiritual think what you spend on Jesus is a waste. When you tell your grandkids, well, I can't afford, Grandpa and Grandma can't afford to do that. And they say, but you give to the church and you give money to missionaries. How come you can't send us on a vacation? And uh, people think that you've got it and I want it, so you should turn it over. See, there was people like that in the very first church. There's people like that in every church. They, they want what you've got and they don't want to work and they don't want to measure up. They just are jealous that you've got God's blessing. So the unsaved and the unspiritual are very similar they will always help you spend your money. They'll be glad to help. They'll vote on how to spend your money, but they won't contribute to help spend money. They'll just vote on how you ought to spend your money. And uh, so Jesus said, the poor you have with you always. So when you're saved, you're not poor. I don't care how much money you don't have, you're not poor. You can't classify yourself as poor when you have a mansion in heaven and your heart's been cleansed and you have a Savior who loves you and promised to answer your prayer and promised to give you everything you need in life. You can't go around saying, well, I'm just a poor person. You're a saved child of the King. I like being a spoiled child of the King. I like being born again and in the family of God. I like my Heavenly Father taking care of my needs. He does a better job of it than I could do. I tell you something, if I stood out on the curb with a sign that said, help me, I'm poor, I'd have less money than I've got now. Because my Heavenly Father takes care of me and He, he takes care of, uh, uh, he, he blesses the actions that I take and He blesses me beyond what I deserve because I love Him and I serve Him and I give to Him and I worship Him and I try to do the best I can with what He already gave me. See, I'm not going to go around poor mouthing on Christians and on God. God's, Christians ought to prosper and they do prosper. And if you'll be honest, you've prospered as Christians. And uh, being uh, poor in this sense is a mindset. But the song says, My father is rich in houses and lands. He holdeth the wealth of the world in his hands. Of rubies and diamonds, of silver and gold. His coffers are full. He has riches untold. I'm a child of the king. A child of the king. With Jesus, my savior, I'm a child of the king. I wish I could sing it for you, but I, I dare not. I want you to stick around. So you have to decide to be this kind of poor. You have to decide that I'm going to convince people that they owe me what I won't work for. See, I'm going to convince people that I'm that kind of poor. 
you have to decide that. You have to reject God's stewardship plan. I don't care how poor you are, if you'll do with your stewardship what God told you to do, you won't be able to stay poor because He'll take care of you. If you will just admit that God is good and God will take care of me and you do what He wants you to do with what you already got, you won't stay poor. You can't stay poor. And a uh, matter of fact, I'll tell you this. I, I'm a, a certified Heliarch welder and, and I worked uh, for the union in the uh, Champlin Oil Refinery and had a union job. And uh, my, uh, my mother-in-law let me in the family when I got that union job. She didn't let me in the family until then. And I got that union job and God called me to preach. I worked there five years and I left that union job and she, my mother-in-law said, you kids will starve to death. It don't look to me like I'm starving to death in the ministry. After 40 years, I haven't starved to death. 52 years of marriage and I haven't starved to death in the ministry. God's taking care of our needs, and I haven't ever been in another union, and I haven't ever had to swear my allegiance to a company. I've swore my allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I serve Him with gladness, and He takes care of my needs, and I'm here to tell you I've got more now than I would have had if I'd have stayed in the union. Now, I don't, I don't say you ought to quit the union. I'm saying you need to follow the Lord, whatever He tells you to do. And as a matter of fact, we drove by that refinery not long ago. It went out of business. It's flatter than a golf course. They took every pipe, every stick of pipe and valve out. It's flat as a golf course. You would never know it was there. I thought, well, now I wonder how that would have turned out if I said, well, I can't leave this good job. I can't leave this good job and go into the ministry without any guarantees. God said, without faith, it is impossible to please Him. He that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. If you're not going to seek Him and you're not going to come to Him by faith, go ahead and stay poor. Go ahead and just live in misery and just wallow in your misery. But if you want God's best in your life, you walk by faith. You do things that God leads you to do and don't be afraid to take a step of faith when He tells you to take a step of faith, whether it's a job or a giving or or, or, or witnessing, or whatever it is. If you'll do what God tells you to do, you'll never go hungry. You'll never go wanting. I'm glad to tell you, I never in my life, I can honestly tell you this, I was saved at 18. I grew up in a middle class family, maybe lower middle class family. Dad worked, but he was never home. Mom worked. And we lived with Grandma and Grandpa in a big old rundown house. And uh, I'm glad to tell you, I, I never in my life Remember going to bed hungry. I never have. I don't know what that's like. But since I got saved, I've gone to bed stuffed. Now, when I was a kid, you had to fight for the last thing. Mom used to say, she's working, Dad's working. She's, we had a big freezer, and she said, uh, you kids, if you need anything to eat, there's food in the freezer. Just get in the freezer and get it. Eight-year-old boy opens the freezer, frozen steaks, frozen. Have you ever tried to eat a frozen hostess snowball? What's an eight-year-old kid going to get out of a freezer and eat? I never had to go to bed hungry. But I'm glad to tell you that I think in the ministry, they try to kill you by feeding you. I think feeding is probably one of the worst uh, sins that, I, that we have is gluttony in the ministry because we eat and we eat good because we don't watch pornography and we don't gamble and we don't do a lot of other things. So what do we do? We talk and eat. <laughs> And we need to do less talking probably and less eating too. Fellowship, yeah. So, and that's a good thing if we don't overdo it, if we don't become gluttons. So I'm saying you have to decide. If you, if you don't want God's blessing, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, doubt God and live without faith and, and, and don't walk by faith and don't believe that He means what He said. And, and then you're the, you're, you'll be the one that suffers from that. But if you believe God and you believe His promises, who and God's not a liar, He can't lie, He's God. If you believe His promises, He's going to take care of all your needs and He's going to give you more like that boy that came home with more fishes than He brought to the meeting. Remember that? Five baskets full, He took home 12 baskets full. I mean, five fishes, He brought home 12 baskets. He brought home more than He brought to the meeting. So the poor you have with you always. And uh, 
you need to, if you, if you decide to be poor, you'll reject God's stewardship and you'll walk by sight, not by faith. You'll refuse to tithe and give offerings as He leads you to give. And you'll just, you'll say, well, I'm just poor. Well, in some cases, I'm not saying in every case, but in some cases, people decided to be poor because they wouldn't do what God told them to do. And that's not healthy. I mean, with your health or with your money, or with your friends, if you don't do what God tells you to do, you can lose it all. You can lose friends, you can lose money, you can lose your health if you won't do what God tells you to do. Amen? So, well, what, uh, what this woman gave was her best. Mark 14, se uh, 14 6 says, And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why, why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. On me. Wouldn't it be good if we got concerned about doing our best no, no, not for our spouse or other people, but for Jesus. Wouldn't it be good if we got concerned about doing our best for Jesus? And, and that's what she did. And, uh, you know, you have people today that they want to give to uh, McDonald's House, SPCA, Make-A-Wish Foundation, the Historical Society, Feed the Children, uh, Save the, uh, the, the Poor African Babies, the Fireman's Fund. And you, it just goes on and on and on. And you know what they do? It irritates me. I, I don't know if you can detect that or not. Probably you can. But they come on there uh, for... They, they come on there, you can support a, a, a disabled veteran for $19 a month, which I'm all for. I'm all for that. If you want to do that. And then they come on there and say for $19 a month, you can support a homeless dog. Wait a minute. You mean a, a veteran that's been disabled is the same value as a homeless dog? I don't get that. They're playing on our sympathies. They're trying to get in our pocketbook. And uh, they show pictures uh, on there that make us feel bad about some circumstance. And they want to give it. And I'm telling you, as much as those kind of events need help and need, we need to give our best to Jesus. Not to the homeless dogs. And not to the... Uh, uh, not to the Salvation Army or Feed the Children and all the other good organizations that there are. I don't care if you support those, and God doesn't care if you support those. But the best support ought to be what I do for Jesus Christ. So they're all good organizations, but they're not empowered to win the lost. They're not empowered to send missionaries. They're not commissioned to preach the gospel. They're not, that's not God's choice for rescuing people. From sin. And I know the churches that I know, some poor person comes in church and they get saved. I know that most churches throw their arms around them and give them food and money and clothes and help them to come up to the standard and, and have the things they need for life. And, uh, and that's helping Jesus. When you, he said, uh, uh, you've done it to the least of one of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. And Jesus said, that's how you honor me is give your best for my cause, for my purpose. I'm the Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And how dare we put him on the same level with the SPCA or the Fireman's Fund or anything else. They don't deserve our best, but Jesus does. So, that's what she did. He said she wrought a good work on me. Why? Because none of them had been commissioned to preach the gospel. None of them were started by our Savior like his church was. And he didn't die for the... The poor animals, he died for the church. He loved the church and gave himself for it. And so, in that church, I like this, in that church, you could go in, and whether it was Mary or another woman, it was Mary in John chapter 3, with a said the odor of her fragrance filled the house. In that church, you could go in there and say, oh, Mary was here. Because the odor filled the house. Have you ever known you, you go to church and you just see the signs of good works and somebody arranged the flowers and somebody swept the floor and somebody uh, dusted the piano and somebody swept the, 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 the hallway and the steps and you go in and you say, well, it's, it's obvious that Mary was here or that Joe was here. Or somebody was here. That, somebody that loves Jesus and they're giving him their best. See? And that's what serving Jesus is all about. About giving him our best, not going to church. We go into church today and say, wow, song books are all tore up and they're on the floor and, and uh, nobody's paying attention to the flowers and nobody cares. No, it seems like nobody cares. 
And you know how we treat the church is what we is how we think about Jesus. Because it's his body, it's his church. And how we treat the church is how we treat is how we treat him. So uh, so in that church someone could say, Mary was here, I, I can smell the fragrance. So I think it's not good to trouble those who are loving him. He said, let her alone. Let her do it. That's what she does. That's what she's got to work with. That's what she does. She did it for me. And leave her alone. She hath done what she could. She's wrought a good work on me. And uh, it's good to love him first and last and most and always. Because this woman did what she could. Verse 8 of Mark 14 said, she hath done what she could. She hath come aforehand to anoint my body to the bearing. So no effort is too great. We're not accountable. And this is important. We're not accountable for what we cannot do. Somebody said, well, I can't preach. No, but you could, uh, you could put in a light bulb. <laughs> said, well, I can't do any electrical work. No, but you can drive a broom. Said, well, I can't uh, do that. Well, you can pick the flowers or... or Pull the weeds out of the garden. There's something you can do. You can do something to show. The, you can do something that you love the same thing that Jesus loved and gave himself for. And so no sacrifice was too large. We're not accountable for what we cannot give. I hear people say, well, I can't, I can't give. I can't give. You know, they can buy a car. They can buy a house. And they have a clothing allowance that they spend at a, grocery, at a, at a shopping center somewhere. But when it comes to church, they can't afford that. They can't afford church. They can't afford to give their best to Jesus. Their first to Jesus. And, uh, uh, you know, when I, when I talk to people about giving to missions, they said, well, we can't, we can't give what we, we can't possibly give what we don't know we're going to have. I said, really? Is that how you bought your house? You signed a contract said, I'll pay for this house, and you didn't have a clue how you're going to pay for this house. You signed a contract for this car, and you didn't have a clue whether or not you're going to make the last payment or not. But when it comes to the Lord, you say, well, I just, I just don't have the faith to do that. But you had the faith to buy a car, and you didn't even know if you're going to keep your job. You had a faith to buy a house when you didn't even know if you're going to stay in town long enough to pay it off. God just wants us to do for Him at least what we'd do for ourselves. He wants us to live by faith and give Him the best and the most and to love Him with all of our heart. No sacrifice was too large and no shadow was too dark in which to serve. We're not accountable for where we cannot go. We're accountable for where we can go and won't. Sure, there are people say, well, I can't go be a missionary. No, you can't, but you can talk to your next door neighbor. <laughs> Uh, we're not accountable for what we can't do. We're accountable for what we can do. Amen? And so Mary left a selfless example. Verse 9. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. This woman. This woman. Uh, she, uh, she, for over 2,000 years, it's been repeated that she gave her most, her best to Jesus. She gave her most, her best to Jesus. Whether it was Mary or just a woman, she gave her most, her best to Jesus. And uh, Paul said to the church at Rome in, Rome, in Romans chapter 1, verse 7, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the the whole world. Wouldn't it be something if, uh, as a matter of fact, I don't, have the, I don't have the print up here in front of me, but there was a, there was a man uh, named, uh, what's that man's name in, on uh, George Street? Uh, no, uh, Gano. Mr. Gano got saved on a ship in the Navy in Australia. And... Uh, he, uh, he never was uh, much uh, vocationally. He was on a ship. He got saved. But he made up his mind. He promised the Lord on the bow of that ship. He said, I promise to witness to everybody that I come to. And so he said uh, to people, he said, uh, 
if you die tonight, would you go to heaven? He said, it's something to think about. And that's all he said. And he'd hand him a tract. If you die tonight, would you go to heaven? That's something to think about. And that's all he said. And he did that for years and years and years and years and years and years, even after he got out of the Navy. Well, this Dr. Dixon was preaching around the country, and everywhere he went, he met somebody that referred to Mr. Gano. He said, Mr. Gano asked me this question. I didn't get saved then, but I went home, and later on I got saved. And he said, I ran into several people that had that connection and didn't really say that he won them to the Lord, but he had that connection with Mr. Gano. And so he said, I've got to find out about this. So he went to Australia, and he, and he, uh, he, he found out uh, if anybody knew this man, and the preacher in town said, oh, yeah, I know who you're talking about, Mr. Gano. And he says he lives uh, on George Street. And uh, so they went to George Street, and the man told him, I've been all over the world, and I've met people in several countries who are connected with your witness to them back in years gone by when you asked them if they were saved. It's something they ought to think about. And Mr. Gano broke down and cried. He said, I've handed out thousands of tracts. I never knew of anybody that ever got saved. That's something you ought to think about. You ought to understand that God will take a witness. You don't have to be the one to tie the knot. You don't have to be the sole winner. That's another one in my book. But you might be the one that plants the seed. You might be the one that waters the seed. You might be the one that for the first time puts a gospel tract in somebody's hand. So what if they turn their back on you? Who knows what the Holy Spirit will do with that in the future. See? So Mary did something that would make a difference. And when you give to missions, you're giving to Jesus. My question today that I have to ask is if I died today, if you died today, would you leave an odor or a fragrance behind? And how long would that fragrance last? How long would it last? How long would they say, wow, I still see the good works that followed that person? How long would it last? Or would they say, there was a country song years ago that said, thank God and Greyhound, you're gone. Yeah. I don't want somebody to say, thank God and Greyhound, he's gone. I want them to say, we missed. I'm working so that when I'm gone, I hope somebody misses me. I want to be missed when I'm gone. I, I, I want to have some unfinished business some work that I've attempted to do, something I've started by faith, something that needs to be taken up by somebody else. I want to be doing something until Jesus comes because I want to be doing something that honors Him and that will cause people to say, boy, uh, there's a big hole in the work because He's gone, see. God want, he doesn't want us to say, well, you know, I don't have much time left. I believe I'll just back off a little bit and let somebody else take up the work. I don't know how many times I've heard somebody say, well, let the younger people take it up. Younger people ain't taking it up. And you're not finished until you're finished. God wants us to go on and on and on. Yes, we need to disciple young people, but it takes some older people to do it. They're not going to disciple themselves. And so the fragrance was still there. So you remember when great drops of blood fell to the ground from the cross. I believe the fragrance of Mary was there. Do you, do you remember when Jesus was betrayed with a kiss from, from a friend in the garden the night of his betrayal? I believe the fragrance of Mary was there. And when he stood in the judgment hall and when he carried his own cross and fell beneath the load and when he laid down on the cross to be nailed to it and when he hung on the cross between two thieves, there was a fragrance about that. He'd been anointed with oil. And the fragrance was there. The fragrance of this woman. She loved him. She gave her best for him in life. And she stood by him in death. As a matter of fact, after all was said and done on the cross, there was only three women that stood by the cross. And John. And one of those women was Mary. Standing by. She stood with him in life. And she stood with him when he finished his life. And her fragrance not only filled the odor of that house, but I believe that fragrance was everywhere she was 
and it was on the Lord Jesus Christ because she loved him. So the question is, Jesus turned to Simon in Luke 7, 44, and he, and he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hairs of her head. And thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto you, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Aren't you glad that your sin debt, I don't know how long your sin debt was, mine was long. My, my, uh, my debt was big. I'm glad that God forgave me. And you know that to whom, he said, to, much, to whom much is forgiven, the same loveth much. How could we not love him who was willing to balance the books, erase the debt, to pay for our sins? How could we not love him with all of our heart and do our best for him and not let ourselves get all caught up in bickering and strife and argument, but we want to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the, uh, the flesh to satisfy it. And we're going to love one another with a pure heart and we're going to trust the Lord and we're going to believe that God has great things in store for His church. It's His church. It's not our church. It's His church. And He loved His church and gave Himself for it. So my question this morning is, have you given Jesus your best? I mean, when you're gone, is there going to be a hole in the garment? There's going to be a hole in the operation? I mean, are, are people going to miss you? Or are you somebody that's going to say, wow, things seem to work better with them out of here. And I don't want to live that way. And I don't want to encourage other people to live that way. And it won't be that way. I've been in some great churches where people had, a, had an unusual commitment to one another, an unusual commitment to Christ. They keep the first and greatest commandment by loving Him with all their heart, and they keep the second commandment by loving each other in spite of the fact that we're all sinners. We're all sinners. And for every sin that I could point out in your life, you could point out some in my life. But that doesn't mean we're not brothers and sisters. It means we're saved by the grace of God. So the question is, are you like the woman who loved Jesus? Or are you trying to impress others saying this money should have been given to the poor? This money should have been used in other purposes. This woman was not ashamed. She left a sweet fragrance. She's memorialized because of her devotion. And so my question is, how do you want to be remembered? I tell you, I want to be remembered as somebody that loved the Bible and loved Christians and loved the church. And loved Jesus. And if you're not there, you ought to get there. If you're here this morning and you've never been born again, you, the, point, the bad part about that is you don't have to be saved. But you don't have to go to heaven either. If you don't get saved, you can't go to heaven. And uh, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you say, well, I don't want to be saved that way. There is no other way to be saved. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And He's willing to forgive all the past walk with you in the present, and take you to heaven. If you're here today and you haven't received His gift, I want to urge you uh, while we sing an invitational hymn to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And if you're here as a Christian and you haven't been giving Him your best and your attitude and your, uh, and your actions, then today would be a good day to get a fresh start with God and say, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to trust Him. I'm going to shoot for the bullseye. I'm going to be on target with God and not slip and slide through life saying I can't and I'm too poor and I don't know what to do. Let God help you to do the best you can with what you've got. I'm going to tell you this in closing. There's nobody more unlikely to be a preacher than me. When I got saved, when I got saved, I didn't think God would use me because my, I had too much guilt, too much sin that I, that I had as a teenager. And... Uh, I'm glad I had a pastor that was able to nurse me through that and help me to know that it's not about me, it's about Jesus. And it's not about me getting better, it's about Him making me better. It's about Him cleaning up this old sinful 
creature and give me a fresh start. And I've, I've never gotten over it. I don't plan to get over it. And I'm looking forward. Honestly, I told you about, I don't know if I told you about, did I tell you about the lady in the Greenbrier nursing home? I want to be like her. She's waiting for Jesus to come. And if you interrupt her and wake her up, she'll be dis disappointed to see anybody but Jesus. That's who she's waiting for. And so I want to encourage you today to receive him and serve him. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, today we love you and we pray that where we go we'll leave a fragrance of beauty, a fragrance of joy and love. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us to serve you and do our best for you. And uh, we ask you, Lord, that you'd work in the hearts and lives of the people in this church and provide for them the leadership that they need to go to the next level of service here. And we we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need to come to the altar, do it today. If you need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, receive Him as your Savior today while we sing. Please turn to hymn number 157. Jesus paid it all. One fifty seven. All right, y'all ready? Here we go. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Verse 2. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and thine alone Can change the leper spots And melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Let's do verse 3. For nothing good have I, whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white. In the blood of Calvary's Lamb, Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. Amen. Thank you all. Let's all bow our heads for prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for this day and for the messages we received today. Help us to, uh, to hide your word in our hearts and uh, to receive the message and to study it and so that we can shine for you, Jesus, and be the light and the salt of the earth and we can just, just grow the numbers for you, Father, and, and lead those to salvation who need it. Father God, we ask for peace and strength on this church and, and for Mrs. Storm. And we just, we love you and we just, we really want to feel your love today, Father. So just bless us with that and just overwhelm us with it. As we go uh, out and back out into the world, Father, just keep us right and keep us strong and help us to come back tonight and to finish the next week off strong, Father. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. And you are dismissed. Hey guys, yep. I just wanted to make sure that uh, Pastor and Mrs. Lewis know how much we appreciate it. Yes. Amen. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.
Well, thank you so much. It's been our privilege, and uh, I, you know, if we were closer, we'd help you some more. I have some other things on the calendar, but if we can do anything, we will, and we're glad to pray for you.